Weapons grade incompetence of Liz Truss's. I don't think you had to be Pollyanna-ish or particularly glass half full to think that Sunak has to be better. He has to be better. And as James reminds us, within hours, he made a mockery of his claim that he was going to bring back professionalism, integrity and accountability. And within a day, he'd put a proven vile bully back in the cabinet on an inflated salary. Why? And uh, what do you make of it all? Time now is 11.45. It's 11.49. Should we summon the Oshwood? So he's supposed to be back from his travels, I've heard. OK. Could we, please, please. I'm going to do it very professionally at this time. Could we summon the Oshwood, please? <laughs> Just keep an eye out for him as we go back to the phones, talking about this bizarre story, really. And the sense of... The, the, the sense of befuddlement, perhaps, or discombobulation. We haven't used that word for a while. It's my favourite word. Discombobulation. Um, uh, the fact that Rishi Sinat would put someone as vile as Gareth, Gareth, Ga- Gavin Williamson back into the cabinet. It's quite bizarre. We'll find out what Theo thinks about it shortly. But first, Mary is in Middlesex. Mary, what do you make of it all? I just um, wanted to address the bullying issue. Mm. Um and it's something that's kind of hit a very raw nerve with me. I'm sorry to hear um, I worked for local authority for over 15 years, and I did a job that I completely loved. Yeah. Um, and over the 15 years, various staff members took out grievances on the head teacher. Yeah. Um, and the various staff that took the grievances out, they literally disappeared. Nobody ever heard from them again. Gosh. We were always told from the head teacher never to contact them. But we all speak, so we all kind of knew why the grievances were being taken out. And was it, it was usually bullying? because of bullying. Yeah. Um, although I was never a direct um, individual that was a victim of it, um, I, I sadly left the job last year because I knew that I was next. Right. Um, we Do had you... an informal informal chat. He had various staff members that would re- 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 would report back to him and feed him various information that had a, that had no relevance. Now then. that's an important point though, because Williamson obviously had a, a sort of army of of, of of sycophants and informers as well, didn't he? Otherwise his tentacles wouldn't have reached into so many corners of the party. Yeah. And I I think for me I just wanted to say it, it happens and it goes on. Um and until more people actually come forward and say, This is what's happened to me this is, um, I'm a victim of this, that and everything else. It's, it's going to continue. Um, in regards to banter, I mean, we work, I work in an organisation, I love banter and I love to have a laugh with people, but it's the receiver and you've got to be very, very mindful of how a comment or a word or an action can actually impact on that person's mental health. O- on a person's mental health, isn't it? Because I think we all, yeah. well, I like to think we all, because then that lets me off the hook slightly, but I can only speak for myself, and I certainly used to judge things according to how they affected me. I think that's the temp, instead of thinking how they might affect someone who's not me. So, you know, Chris in touch earlier who had a breakdown after being bullied at work, and... And yet, 10 years ago, I'd have sat here and said, well, I did my best work when I was terrified of my news editor and being shouted at every day. Someone else could have been led to a nervous breakdown by that behaviour. I mean, I think, I think it, it's, it's on various levels. I mean, I'm, I'm very much, if I've done something wrong, approach me, tell me what I've done and yeah. let's just deal with it. But don't go over my head and don't talk about me behind my back because you're, you're not doing what you should be doing. You should, you're my leader. You should be leading me. And you should be leading by example. How do we um, deal? And, and you don't have to answer this because it's not what you phoned in to talk about. But <laughs> it, it was something touched on by James in the New Forest. It, when, when someone is actually an effective leader by bullying, it does happen. It's less and less commonplace now. I suppose you, you'd have to dredge up someone from a few years ago in order to come up with any meaningful example. But someone who actually does get results... By, by, by ruling with fear, how, how do we how do we yeah, pop I, that I, balloon? I, I personally believe that you can rule with fear, but the receiver doesn't feel that they are being bullied. I mean, yeah. I'm doing a job now that I absolutely love, and the reason oh, why I love it that. is because it works. My manager is very vocal with me, very matter of fact, yes. and very down the middle that. 
you've done this wrong, it's okay, move on. Um, I, I do believe to be a, a leader or a manager of any establishment, obviously you've got to be firm and you've got to be strong. You can't sugarcoat things like sickness, for instance. You can't just brush that under the carpet. Oh, don't worry about it. We'll just let it escalate and still do nothing about it. No, and, and also I, you need to know the chain of consequence. That's the thing about what therapists call hypervigilance, when you're in a state of constant fear because there's no rationality to the attacks. So no, and, if you I know mean, you're going to get into trouble if you do something wrong, or you're going to get, there will be consequences if you do something wrong. But bullies thrive on an environment where you don't know. On, on a Monday, you could get a hero gram for doing something. And on a Wednesday, with a, with a cowardly, unhinged bully as your boss, you could get attacked for doing the thing you got praised for on Monday. I mean, bullies have narcissistic traits. And I think that needs to be, I'm not saying that we need to explore that but you don't just wake up one morning and say today i'm going to be a bully to be a bully takes it it, it, for me it's a skill Mm. because you've got you've got to manipulate somebody um and to manipulate somebody and break them down for me that is it's 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 gross isn't it you you, you describe a form of psychological warfare or torture and and of course sunak sees this and thinks i want a bit of that or i want to keep him sweet or i want him on my team and that is keep, keep him sweet while everybody else is actually um, speaking, like speaking personally and speaking truthfully. Um, I also believe that if you're not, if you've never been a direct um, victim of anything that affects you mentally or physically, I believe that you, it's probably wrong of me to say this, but you don't have as much empathy. Like, oh, they'll be all right. It was just the word or it was just this, it was just that. But you know what? To actually sit at home and fall apart because you feel inadequate. Yeah. Yeah, you've either been there or you haven't. I think you're probably yeah. right. I think certainly in the in the context of my own experiences, never having felt like you felt made it an awful lot easier for me to, to, to sort of defend even, mostly dismiss, but sometimes even defend really bad behaviour in, in, in the workplace on, on spurious grounds. Thank you, Mary. That was so helpful and, and a beautiful conclusion in many ways to this conversation because time now to turn our attention to the imminent PMQs and Theo Washwood is here to help us. It's, un, it's inevitable, James, that Keir Starmer is going to bring up Gavin Williamson, so mm. Gavin Williamson, uh, and he's going to, I would imagine, focus on what Rishi Sunak, when he knew it, why, why he still decided to give him that job in mm. the cabinet. Mm. Uh, and of course, it was just a job as a minister in the cabinet office. So You get a pay right. You, you get a cabinet salary yes. for that, wouldn't you? So he's given him 40 grand a year, really, yes. off, off Pat for, for very little, as far as we can tell. I mean, but, but more than the money, he has the influence of in course, the cabinet office. Of he has the influence. And, and from those I was speak, speaking to, say, very influential in number 10, working for Rishi Sunak. Um, but of course... Uh, the reason he got the job is because Sir Gavin Williamson was better to have on the team mm. than on the back benches causing uh, trouble. And it's worth reminding ourselves, of course, that back in the summer when Rishi Sunak first went up against Liz Truss, he managed to corral a significant number of MPs, the majority of MPs, very, very quickly to support his uh, campaign. He then did the same mm. when faced possibly going up against Boris Johnson or Penny Morden, managed to get the MPs on side. He had Mark Spencer, a former chief whip, of course, under Boris Johnson, who's now gone into the Department for uh, Environment. Uh, Mark Harper, Transport Secretary, again, a former chief whip. And then, of course, Sir Gavin Williamson, a for- another ch- former chief whip, who, of course, was very influential in ensuring that he had the support amongst MPs, not only the first time round. Of course, it wasn't good enough the first time round because it went to the membership, but certainly the second time round, when, in effect, we had a coronation without it going to the membership. And had it gone to the membership, Rishi Sunak... Would may well have lost that contest. So it was a reward and it was a very expensive price to pay for Rishi Sunak, given that he stood on outside Downing Street when he became Prime Minister and re- promised to uh, return integrity and professionalism how, to the heart of government. I don't know if you can answer this. Um, how likely is it that, that Williamson could have used some of the tactics he deployed as a chief whip in order to 
collect votes for the candidate he'd chosen to back in a leadership election. I mean, if if, if I mean, you, you heard yeah. our Milton last night on Channel Four News sort of talking it's about the same, his, it's the same operation. His fascination with sexual peccadilloes or sexual habits. His his his, his claim that he owned someone who'd received financial help from the Whips Office. Most people wouldn't know about that, would they? Only yeah. the person who received the check, the person who handed over the check, and the person who signed off on the check. But if you're trying to get a vote for your preferred candidate in a leadership election, you say, "Oh, be nice little uh, bailout you got there. Be a shame if something happened to it." Or or Oh, hello. It's the same. It's the same operation. I'm not saying it's happened or not but it happened. Could do. It but could it's the do. same. It's the same opera. It's the same whipping operation. You're trying to work out why place. he's of value to Rishi Sunak. All we know about him is that he's very good at, at, at bullying. Well, of getting, you know, for a government to function, James, yes, there is the bullying, and that's been evidence in the in the uh, WhatsApp messages mm. and um, what's been said. What's been said, you know, the Guardian got the story on civil servants, but but but. A government to function has to get its MPs through the particular lobby at a particular time in a particular, uh, in order to get its business through and, and command the confidence of the House of Commons. Now, the tactics that Gavin Williamson used to do that are what is now going to be scrutinised by the uh, the independent grievance uh, procedures. But th that is something that is perfectly normal. But yeah. what is what is abnormal or what wouldn't be tolerated in another workplace? Is to is to use um, threats or abuse or the the prospect of outing somebody for something they may may have done in their private life uh, and uh, making it making the the public aware of it or somebody they might love aware of it. Indeed, we, we are as ever keeping a close eye on the House of Commons, where we will cross to live the moment that Keir Starmer gets to his feet. Will he bring? Because I mean, he's, he's he's never more loyally is he than than at PMQs. And the question about were you advised not to hire. Suella Braverman was ducked by Rishi Sunak. Yes, didn't answer that one. A couple of weeks ago, or, or last week, I forget. Two, like, two weeks ago. Two when you were here. Lewis Goodall did a, a, a sterling job of standing in, in for you last week. But he, he ducked that one, essentially mm. conceding that he must have been, because if he hadn't yeah. been, he could he have said so. Couldn't say it, couldn't say it. He'll do the same today, will he, with Gavin Williamson, perhaps? Yes, and it'll be the it'll be up to Keir Starmer to point. Jake that, Berry's point already that. said that he's told him not to hire him, and he was chairman of the but, party but the, at the but, time. But, but what's ironic about this, James, is it was exactly that reason that Rishi Sunak decided yeah. to hire him. It's, it's not a case of not knowing what his skill set were. Mm. He was promoted because of his skill set to uh, be the cabinet office minister. So that Rishi Sunak would not just as a point of reward for Gavin Williamson, but also as a way of getting to MPs because he's got Sends somebody the in the very out. heart of government yeah. as a link man to MPs who might be might be causing problems or might be threatening to rebel on like a particular a sort of, issue. Like a red button whips office, an alternative. An alternative you know, I can send out, office. Gavin can go and sort this one for me. Anything else? You've been very, very good lately at predicting PMQs, actually. I, it, so he's got to so, mention Williamson. He might well mention Bing Braverman up again. What, what, what else? So I think... I think Small boats? I, I'm not sure. You weren't here last week. Did you catch it? He successfully deployed immigration as a Labour leader, as a stick with which to beat a Conservative leader. I've never seen anything like that before in my life. No, um, that, that's, um, that's, that's very unusual, yes. um, James. I, I think we've got the mini budget coming up next Thursday, and obviously the, the Commons is taking a recess. I, I would expect Rishi Sunak to potentially try to move on from Gavin Williamson to deploy maybe an announcement ahead of that mini budget, maybe around... Uh, pensions or the uprating of universal credit to distract attention away. Keir Starmer, I think, will want to bring back um, the topic of conversation to what actually affects people. Because whilst Gavin Williamson uh, makes good stories, it doesn't actually his his decision to resign as a cabinet minister doesn't actually affect people's lives out there. No, in the but real it would affect polling. Yes, which has been pretty static since Sunak took over. There's been a mild, he has not made the, a mild bounce, but nothing impact. like what MPs would have been hoping for. And this and if just it's adds, same, and if it's same same, nothing's changed. Here we go. You promised us professionalism and integrity, and we're, and we're two, two weeks, weeks in, and we've got two and massive is, scandals and one scalp. And it's the fastest scalp ever. I meant to ask you about that. Is it a, a new prime minister, new cabinet appointment? The, the only, oh, the only one that might be is, is David Laws. What did he the go coalition. for? Coalition, didn't he? His expenses. Can't remember. Correct. Me. I'll, I'll look that up. But David Laws, in the in the first days of the coalition, uh, resigned as chief secretary to the treasury. We shall watch with interest this uh, this particular PMQs. Gavin Williamson, um, really three hmm. three separate prime ministers. He's he's left their governments in disgrace. Yes, he did. Theresa May thought he'd compromise national security. 
Boris Johnson, who never really fired anyone for anything, ran out of patience with his handling of the exams fiasco yeah. during the coronavirus crisis and, and little things like opening primary schools at nine o'clock in the morning because they were safe and then shutting them all at half past three. Here's Keir Starmer. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I join the Prime Minister in his comments about Remembrance Day? Uh, we remember all those who paid the ultimate price and all those who have served and are serving our country. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the member for South Staffordshire told a civil servant to slit their throat. How does the Prime Minister think the victim of that bullying felt when he expressed great sadness at his resignation? Answer him. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, unequivocally the behaviour complained of was unacceptable and it is absolutely right, it is absolutely right that the right honourable gentleman has resigned. For the record, I did not know about any of the specific concerns relating to his conduct as Secretary of State or Chief Whip, which date back some years. I believe that people in public life should treat others with consideration and respect, and those are the principles that this government will stand by. Mr Speaker, the member for South Staffordshire spent years courting the idea he can intimidate others, yeah. blurring the lines to normalise bullying behaviour. Yeah. It's precisely why the Prime Minister gave him a job. Yeah. The truth is simple. He's a pathetic bully, yeah. but he would never get away with it if people like the Prime Minister didn't hand him power. Yeah. So does he regret his decision to make him a government minister? Mr Speaker, I obviously regret appointing someone who has had to resign in these circumstances. But I think, but I think what the British people would like to know is that when situations like this arise, that they will be dealt with properly. And that's why... And that's why it is absolutely right that he resigned, and it's why it is absolutely right that there is an investigation to look into these matters properly. I said my government would be characterised by integrity, professionalism and accountability, and it will. Mr Speaker, everyone in the country knows someone like the member for South Staffordshire. Yeah. A sad middle manager getting off on intimidating those beneath him. Yeah. But everyone in the country also knows someone like the Prime Minister. Yeah. The boss who is so weak, yeah. so worried the bullies will turn on him, that he hides behind them. What message does he think it sends when, rather than take on the bullies, he lines up alongside them and thanks them for their loyalty? Mr Speaker, the message that I clearly want to send is that integrity in public life matters. And that is why... That is why it is right that the right honourable member has resigned. It is why it is right that there is a rigorous process to examine these issues. But as well as focusing on this one individual, it is also right and important that we keep delivering for the whole country. And that is why this government will continue to concentrate on stabilising the economy, on strengthening the NHS and on tackling illegal migration. Those are my priorities. Those are the priorities of the British people, and this government will deliver on them. Mr Speaker, the problem is he can't stand up to a run-of-the-mill bully, yeah. so he has no chance of standing up to vested interests on behalf of working people. Yeah. Take Shell. They made record profits this year, £26 billion. How much have they paid under his so-called windfall tax? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, I was Chancellor who introduced an extra tax on the oil and gas companies. But he talks, he talks, Mr Speaker, he talks about working people. The right honourable member voted against legislation to stop strikes disrupting working people. He voted, he voted against legislation to stop extremist protesters disrupting working people. That's because he's not on the side of working people, Mr Speaker. That's what the Conservatives are for. 
Mr Speaker, I'm, I'm against all of those causing chaos, damage to our public services and to our economy, whether they are gluing themselves to the road or sitting on the government benches. Mr Speaker, there was no answer to the question because the answer is nothing. Shell haven't paid a penny in windfall tax. Why? Because for every pound they spend digging for fossil fuels, he hands them a 90p tax break, and it's costing the taxpayer billions. So will he find a backbone and end his absurd oil and gas giveaway? Well, Mr Speaker, what the party opposite will never understand is that it's businesses investing that create jobs in this country. Mr Speaker, we on this side of the House, we understand that. We will support businesses to invest, to create jobs, because that's how we create prosperity, that's how we support strong public services, and that's what you get with a Conservative government. There's only one party that crashed the economy, and they're all sitting there. It's a pattern. Mr Speaker, it's a pattern with this Prime Minister. Too weak to sack the security threats sat around the Cabinet table. Too weak to take part in a leadership contest after he lost the first one. Too weak to stand up for working people. He spent weeks flirting with the climate change deniers in his party, then scuttled off to COP at the last minute. In the Budget next week, he'll be too weak to end his oil and gas giveaway, scrap the non-DOM tax breaks, and end the farce of taxpayers subsidising private schools. That's what Labour would do, a proper plan for working people. Mr Speaker, if he can't even stand up to a cartoon bully with a pet spider, if he's too scared to face the public in an election, what chance has he got of running the country? We won't. Shh. We want to try and get through on time, and I know some members want to catch my eye. They're not doing a good job so far. Come on, Prime Minister. M- Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman talks about judgment about putting people around the Cabinet table. I would just gently remind him he thought the member for Islington North was the right person to look after our security. But, Mr. Speaker, the, the Honourable Gentleman, the Honourable Gentleman, he's. He said a lot today. He said a lot today, but it's clear that he isn't focused on the serious issues that are confronting our country. We're strengthening our economy. He's backing the strikers. We're supporting people with energy bills. He's supporting the protesters. And we're tackling illegal migration. He's opposing every measure. The British people want real leadership on the serious global challenges we face, and that's what they'll get from this government. Mr Speaker, 84 years ago today in Germany, hundreds of synagogues were destroyed, Torah schools were desecrated, thousands of Jewish businesses and and shops were destroyed as well. 91 Jewish people were murdered and later 30,000 Jewish men were sent to the concentration camps. So as we commemorate Kristallnacht, let us remember that it was started with anti-Jewish hatred It became anti-Semitism, and it's still prevalent in society today. So will my right hon. Friend condemn anti-Semitism in all its forms, but congratulate the Holocaust survivors who give their testimony year after year, and in particular congratulate the Holocaust Educational Trust for the brilliant work they do in making sure we will never, ever forget what happened in the Holocaust. Well, can I thank my honourable friend for his powerful question and his continued work on this issue. Uh, I completely agree with him. Anti-Semitism has no place in our society, and we're taking a strong lead in tackling it in all forms. We became the first country to adopt the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, and the government's independent adviser on anti-Semitism regularly provides advice to ministers on how best to tackle this issue. And can I join him, as I know the whole House will, in praising the work of those survivors who so bravely tell their stories so that we might never forget. SNP leader Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I associate myself with the remarks of the 
Prime Minister for Armistice to say we remember those that paid the ultimate sacrifice, those that continue to serve, and we should also remember the nuclear test veterans who continue to yeah, yeah, seek yeah, justice yeah, yeah. for themselves. Mr Speaker, last night the Prime Minister suffered the self-inflicted loss of his first Cabinet Minister. A couple of weeks into the job, it turns out this Prime Minister's judgment is every bit as bad as his predecessors. <laughs> Speaking of which, we now know that his former friend, the former Prime Minister, plans to hand out seats in the House of Lords to at least four Tory MPs, including the current Secretary of State for Scotland. So here's another test of judgment for the new Prime Minister. Does he think it right to keep a man in the Cabinet who is clearly far more interested and in getting his hands on an ermine robe than playing by the rules of Scottish democracy. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I'm obviously not going to comment on speculation around such lists. Any list would, of course, follow the normal procedures and processes that are in place. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm afraid it's uh, not speculation, and of course the Prime Minister clearly doesn't get how corrupt this all looks yeah, yeah. to people in Scotland. Exactly. Because not only do we have a UK government that denies democracy, we now have a Secretary of State that is running scared from it. In the middle of a Tory cost of living crisis, the Scotland office is now to be led by a baron in waiting, yeah. biding his time until he can cash in on the 300 day job for life in the House of Lords. He should be sacked from the Cabinet and the people of Dumfries and Galloway should be given the chance to sack the Tories in a by-election. The Prime Minister's judgment is already in tatters. If he has any integrity left, will he now put a stop to these two predecessors stuffing the House of Lords with his cronies? Mr Speaker, what the Secretary of State and I are jointly focused on is working constructively with the Scottish Government to deliver for the people of Scotland. I will be pleased to be meeting the First Minister tomorrow because that, I think, is what the people of Scotland want to see. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Criminal gangs who are operating to bring people into this country in small boats, an issue that directly affects my constituents and folks in Hyde, are openly using social media platforms to recruit It is 12.16, and um, we think that one MP may ask a question about Charlotte Lynch's arrest yesterday. If, if that happens, then obviously we'll, we'll bring that back to your attention. But for, for the time being, we'll, we'll pull out a PMQs there and pick over the bones of it in the company of our inimitable political editor, Theo Washwood, after this. It's 20 minutes after 12. We will bring it to your attention, if anything, unfolding in the House of Commons at the moment as PMQs continues, although the Leader of the Opposition and the Leader of the Scottish National Party's interventions are concluded. Theo Washwood is here. Um, I suppose the only way it could have gone worse for Rishi Sunak is if Gavin Williamson hadn't resigned yesterday and he would have been defending someone who was still in post despite telling colleagues to slit their throats it, and jump out of windows. It, it was a 6-0 win. The Keir Starmer. Again. again. Yes, again. Um, and, and the reason I say that is what Keir Starmer managed to do successfully this time is to take what is essentially a Westminster story. It didn't necessarily need forensic questioning, which of course we know that Keir Starmer is so good at. What he needed to do and what he did successfully was to take a Westminster story and to build a narrative that everybody understood, that people mm. could relate to, that idea of a sad middle manager bully, and then you go and complain to the big boss about the sad middle, middle manager bully who has a pet spider in the corner. Strong Cronus, the tarantula. Cartoon character with a pet spider. Cartoon bully with a pet spider. That's going to... St well, it would stick if Gary uh, Williamson was... And, might be and, back in six days, of course. But, of course, but, but Gavin Williamson for Keir Starmer is inconsequential. The... the this yeah. is about um, Rishi Sunak's, uh, his, his role in this, and the fact that Rishi Sunak knew of what had been said, or this is the allegation, uh, about Gavin Williamson. And, and Keir Starmer going in on that letter where he said it was with great sadness that he had to accept the resignation of Gavin Williamson. What would that feel like if you were the civil servant and a minister had come in and said, well, you should just go and slit your throat? And I use that very advisedly at this time of the day. Yeah, no, I, I mean, what, how, how, would you, how would you feel? And the point is that it's on him, Rishi mm. Sunak. Now, in reply, Rishi Sunak was very careful with his language 
because he says, for the record, I did not know about any of the specific concerns relating to his conduct as Secretary of, St of State or Chief Whip, Whip, which date back some years. Specific working very hard in that instance, uh, James. So the idea is that Rishi Sunak, and he didn't say it there, but going by what he's given in this answer to Keir Starmer, did know about the, the picture that uh, came or the baggage that came with Gavin Williamson, what he was good at doing, why he was good at doing it, although he's insisting that he didn't know uh, about those particular comments that I just... Uh, As you uh, say, doing a lot of heavy lifting, the word specific, because Jake Berry, who was chairman of the party at the time of uh, Williamson's reappointment, has been pretty explicit about what he told the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. He's told him some specific details, I, I think. Yes, uh, and, 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 and he was... And he was you know, he was there and he knew what had um, happened. The Prime Minister also saying, and I should put this in, put this, is that unequivocally the behaviour complained about uh, was unacceptable. Um, and of course, he's trying to say that actually he can, he can and he said this on uh, to, in the House of Commons, that he can stand on that record uh, of uh, the fact that his government is one of integrity and professionalism. Mm. But Keir Starmer trying to <laughs> ensure that that lands, that how can you say, well, we stand for integrity and professionalism, and yet you promote a man who has behaved uh, in this way towards uh, colleagues, both in the civil service side of things and also uh, politically. And then, he, of course, he moved on at the end to more substantive issues. Uh, and I think we're going to hear a lot about this when it comes to the windfall tax and this loophole that exists at the moment, which allows companies like Shell, if they invest their profits into uh, fossil fuels, to actually claim back 90 pence in the, every pound that they invest. And that means, of course, that there isn't going to be that pot of money unless Rishi Sunak closes that loophole by preventing that tax break being offered to companies like Shell, which could then be used to fund, well, at the moment it's around 30, 30 billion to 50 billion, um, uh, in terms of uh, helping us with our energy bills going into the winter. Indeed. Um, you mentioned some of that, of course. The message I want to send, he said, is that integrity in public life matters. And then he sat down next to Suella Braverman. Yes. Um, who was beside him on the front bench. Which is, I mean, some might suggest that that was unfortunate. Kevin Schofield, who is the political yeah. editor of Huff Post, tweeted yes. 13 minutes ago, <laughs> Rishi Sunak is going to have to break glass and crack open the emergency Jeremy Corbyn attack line at this rate. Took about three minutes. Yes, and he did. Between he did. that tweet from Kevin Schofield at Huff Post and Rishi Sunak cracking open the glass and, 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 and breaking up the Jeremy Corbyn attack line. But, but Keir Starmer has, has, tr has tried throughout his time as leader to to draw a line under Jeremy Corbyn, and he's done it successfully, and his record... He's not even in the Labour Party. He's not in the Labour Party Parliamentary Labour Party. Parliamentary Labour Party. Um, <laughs> Do you think... Let me guess, I know you don't like speculation, but I think you're safe on this one. Do you think that for Rishi Sunak, if he can get through a PMQs without feeling the need to try to resurrect the ghost of Jeremy Corbyn, he would consider that to be a win? Because I think this... Kevin, Huff Post chap Kevin is correct, isn't he? It's 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 not something you're going to go for first. Comedians always say, I don't know if you're familiar with this. If you tell me a bad joke, I'd say to you, oh, I wouldn't open with it. It's he's not going to open with a Jeremy Corbyn line. No. He is literally he's only going to reach to it. for it when he's in trouble. Well, I think there's a difference. I think there's a fundamental difference between Labour and the Conservatives. And you mentioned the comedian line. If if you're a stand-up comedian, that I haven't been to a stand-up comedian show for a very long time. But what they try to do is they have a, they have a thread to their shows, right? They have a they have a narrative that they try to build, and the problem that Rishi Sunak has got is that he's trying to build a narrative about Keir Starmer, but he hasn't got any new material. There are, new, yeah. there are no new jokes. There are no new gags. Keir Starmer is not offering him anything up in, in terms of major faux pas. We had, uh, we had that particular issue with uh, the MP who, of course, made that re reference to Kwasi Kwarteng, the former chancellor. She was kicked out of the parliamentary party within the space of an hour. Mm. He just doesn't tolerate it. So he offers them very little wriggle room, the, lead the Conservative leadership, to build, to add any new material to their narrative about the fact that he's soft when it comes to criminal justice about whether he is a he supported Jeremy Corbyn when he was in Jeremy Corbyn's shadow cabinet he doesn't allow that whereas week every, every day that goes by with this government and going back to Liz Truss and Boris Johnson Labour always is, has a new has a new set of jokes to which go with is something his, they must have thought would end with with Johnson if not with Truss the idea that 
in many ways, the Suella Braverman scandal was overtaken by the Gavin Williamson scandal. And that, that had an air of the Johnson days. But Johnson would somehow manage to ride these waves of filth and, and use one to subsume the other one. So yeah. it would be like, well, I'm not going to get hit with this because I'm going to be in trouble for something but, else. But next the Tories week. are constantly. Sunak's not good at being bad in the way but, that Johnson was good at being bad. That's fair. Hmm. That's fair. You, you have to have a sort of a shamelessness to yes. it. You have to be able to front it and you have to be able to lean we into it. You have to genuinely not care. I would say. Well, I, uh, you, have to, you have to be able to. You have to be able to to put a set of blinkers on in politics, yeah. and and just ride it out and and stick to your guns. That you know that if you keep on taking the line, making your point, taking the line, battering away, that you can get through it. And you can't and you can't give anything in your voice or in your demeanour that makes you think that there is any doubt in your mind about what you are saying. And when you listen to Liz Truss and you listen to Rishi Sunak, they don't quite have that self-belief that Boris Johnson had. And that's why he was such a formidable politician. And, and I mean that as in from a neutral's perspective, yes, of course, an impartial of course. perspective. Yes, I understand that. And, 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 and Rishi Sunak doesn't necessarily have that quality. And, I, and it, it's very rare to see that quality in in any, many other politicians, you could count them on probably one hand. But the problem that he's ultimately got is that Rishi Sunak, and this is this goes back to Liz Truss, is the setup of these conservative leadership contests mean that you have to reach out to people that you wouldn't necessarily want to reach out to, particularly if you're saying, I want to draw a line under previous misgivings or misdemeanours by another administration, namely Boris Johnson or Liz Truss, where it didn't go well and you want to bring people in who have credibility uh, and integrity and professionalism but at the same time, you're having to rely on people who don't necessarily carry those qualities, and you have to rely on them because of the setup of your party's leadership contest. And George points out he's sat between Suella Braverman and Dominic Raab. Uh, George suggests that's a very picture of weakness. Tory MPs are, 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 are being a fractious bunch at the best of times. They're not going to be enjoying this. No. Um, he, he, needs, he needs some sort of win, and he needs it soon. Well, yes. I think, I think there's also maybe a sense or a feeling that actually given what's going to be coming down coming in terms of the mini budget and the statement that actually it's going to be so it's going to be so grim for the yeah. for the government and also it's going to be grim for people as well it's going to be no grim mistake. for labor too because they'll be left with i mean it's a bit of a, 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 a bit of a sort of in-house wrangle this but they're going to be left with questions about will you abandon well, you this do? will you do that Precisely. will you do the other so but but in the short term it, he's about to do the polar opposite of what Liz Truss did but, but he is and and but what he's also going he's also got to do is if he can if he can keep things in terms of the financial markets he can uh, everything on a, on, a, on a steady plane then then we don't have the unrest that we saw previously. And MPs have backed him. It hasn't gone to the membership. He has the support there, potentially. Then actually he could poten he can ride it out over the course of the next year. Um, but yes, you're right to say, I think that if we're in the same, if the Conservatives are in the same position in a year, 18 months' time, uh, then and you're going into a general election, uh, then there will be some nervousness about whether he's the right man to lead the party into that general election if the Conservatives are in the same place in the polls. Indeed. Reports this morning as well that he, he did not get fired, that he offered to resign and Sunak tried to talk him out of it in the first instance, but that as the day went on it became, became a, an unsustainable, unsustainable position. Untamed. Interesting point you made, a lot, a lot of praise coming. Did you use the phrase you have to lean into the wickedness? Not into the wickedness. Oh, so someone, was just, Did I say someone wickedness? was just complimenting oh, you for that. I'd, I'd, I'd take the win I wouldn't, if I, I wouldn't accuse you. No, it's probably me. It's probably me. It's probably me. No, it must have been me. You have me. to lean into what you're yes, saying. Yes, exactly. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes, of course. They've added the word wickedness to yeah, you. I, that's I, that's I, their I would opinion, never not yours. No, I know you wouldn't. I was just struck by the poetry of it, man. Come on. You know, I'm just trying to get a bit lyrical. In the, in the old studio. But um, I, I've, I've lost my thread now. Oh, yes, that wonderful thing. The point you made about Starmer dealing very quickly with problems in the ranks. Yes. Some might argue too quickly, mm -hmm. but he is not allowing any uh, problems to fester. So Shut if Sunak had come out on the day that the Sunday Times had those texts... But he can't. Because, because Jake he, Berry has said you knew about them. No, he can't do it because he can't be seen. He can't let Gavin Williamson skulk off to the back benches feeling that he's been done over by Rishi Sunak because then Gavin Williamson works against him. He has to make it Gavin Williamson's decision to go. The cartoon bully with a pet spider, as he will henceforth be officially referred to on this. Sorry, I beg your pardon, Sir Cartoon Bully. 
with a pet spider. Maybe not for long, actually. I mean, you, is that a reasonable possibility? Yeah, it's going. Like I that? mean, the Lib Dems have written to um, Sir Chris Wormald, the chair of the Forfeiture Committee, are saying that if he's found guilty, he should be stripped of his knighthood. Shall we, speaking of Lib Dems, shall we see if that member of Parliament has asked about Charlotte Lynch's arrest yesterday? I, 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 I'm talking to you, James. I, I, I don't, we don't know. know. We don't, I don't know. I can find out for you. Oh, sorry, splendid. Amelia Cox is here now with your headlines. It is 12.35 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. An embarrassment of riches today. No sooner do we bid farewell to Theo Usherwood than we bid a transatlantic hello to Simon Marks, our US editor, because those midterms have been putting multiple cats among multiple pigeons, Simon. Where do you want to start? Well, I think that's absolutely right, James. They have been. Um, I mean, I suppose we should start with the failure of the Republican red wave to materialise. This was the massive wave of support that Donald Trump on the campaign trail had been calling for uh, over the past several weeks. Uh, And there is no question that it was not the night that he and the Republicans had hoped for. Now, let's be absolutely clear, it is still highly likely that the Republicans will end up controlling the House of Representatives, uh, although uh, we're still waiting for results to come in in several uh, key contested races in California and New York that will largely, uh, I think, determine the outcome of that. But uh, the smart money still thinks that the Republicans will end up with a slim majority in the House of Representatives. The Senate, however, is absolutely at this point on a knife edge. We saw uh, the Trump-backed candidate Dr. Mehmet Oz in Mm. Pennsylvania go down to defeat to Democrat John Fetterman. I mean, that in large measure was a defeat to tied to the fact that the Republicans ran an even more extreme candidate in Pennsylvania for the post of governor, Uh, again, Trump-backed, endorsed and and really created – Um, But he went down to massive defeat and uh, the voters uh, clearly were shying away from Republican candidates in the state and that uh, attached itself to Dr. Oz. So the good doctor's uh, hopes of finding himself sitting in the U.S. Senate as opposed to his more normal perch in a television studio because he's the host of a syndicated medical TV show have been dashed. Um, That was the all important Democratic Party pickup, because remember, going into into these elections, the Senate was split 50-50, so both parties needed to hold everything they had, and ideally they were looking to flip a seat. Well, the Democrats have flipped Pennsylvania. However, nail-biting hours remain, because out in Nevada, uh, the Republicans may flip a seat currently held by a Democrat. If they do, it will then be all square, and all eyes will move very rapidly to Georgia, uh, where the incumbent Democrat senator, Raphael Warnock, is in a neck-and-neck race now with the Trump-backed challenger Herschel Walker, the former NFL Mm. uh, champion star. If neither of those candidates uh, secures more than 50% of the vote as currently looks likely because there is a third-party libertarian siphoning votes away, then it goes to a runoff. And that runoff won't happen until December the 8th, so we'll be in for a month of uncertainty over which party controls the Senate. Now, the Democrats, of course, are arguing that this was, and, and, and justifiably so, a much better night for Joe Biden and the Democrats than they had dared to imagine. Joe Biden absolutely has bucked... Um, historical precedent uh, and uh, has not suffered uh, what Barack Obama famously referred to as the shellacking uh, that he encountered in midterm elections when he was president of the United States. However, the caveat to all of this is that we are still looking at a situation in Georgia, for example, where Herschel Walker, a man who under normal Mm. circumstances would never ever have stood a snowball's chance of finding uh, himself sitting in the United States Senate. A man who has raised questions about evolution, uh, who has absolutely hewed himself to Donald Trump's, uh, adhered himself to Donald Trump's entirely false claims about election fraud in the United States. A man who is opposed to abortion under all circumstances without exceptions 
except two women then came forward during the course of the last few weeks to allege that he impregnated both of them and then paid for both of their abortions. A man whose own family has urged Georgia voters not to back him, calling him a serial liar and a deadbeat dad. He's still taken 48.5% of the vote in the state of Georgia. So this idea, you know, that this yeah. that this evening was necessarily a triumph for democracy and the beginning of the end to what President Biden argued was the United States potentially embarking on the path to chaos, that is definitely an overblown argument here this morning. Chickens being counted before they've hatched. I'll come back to Herschel Walker in a moment. And he may well be your answer to this question. Has there been a measurable difference in the performance of Trump-backed Republicans and Republicans who had managed to maintain a little distance from from the the former president who of course continues to lie about that uh, that election result that you well it's to. very difficult i think to draw those conclusions yet i mean uh, on the one hand uh, there are clearly trump backed candidates like dr oz yes. who have gone down to defeat and doug mastriano the uh, republicans candidate for the um governorship in uh, pennsylvania uh, as as i say as extreme a republican candidate as they come i mean a man who actually uh, was at the Capitol riots on Mm, January the 6th of last year. Um, So those candidates rejected in a state like Pennsylvania. But if you go up the road to Ohio, J.D. Vance absolutely endorsed and um, the winner of the Donald Trump sort of Willy Wonka golden ticket in Ohio, he romped home to victory uh, over his Democratic challenger. Um, You can look down in Arkansas, where the former press secretary, for Donald Trump at the White House, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, a woman who lied relentlessly to the press and to the public when she stood behind that White House podium, slavishly loyal to President Donald Trump. She's the new governor of Arkansas. So there are Trump candidates all over the map that have triumphed, and he will absolutely make that point when we hear I mean, we heard it from him last night, even while the votes were being counted. But equally, there is evidence to support the view that if the Republicans had not, in Mm. some of these key races, embraced people like Dr. Oz and Herschel Walker, again, people who under any normal circumstances, uh, you know, would never get closer to the U.S. Senate than taking a guided tour of it. If they hadn't embraced those candidates and instead had gone uh, for people who had put distance between themselves and Donald Trump and his conspiracy theories, we might then be looking at an outcome here that does not buck the historical trend and could have given Joe Biden a much larger headache. And, uh, yeah, and to, just to put that historical trend in, in context, it, it's, it's, it's close to unprecedented, the, the performance for an incumbent president. As, as you mentioned, you know, everyone from Barack Obama to Ronald Reagan got absolutely tanked in, uh, at this point in their presidencies. But, but we're not in normal times as we, as we constantly remind ourselves. I, 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 very simple question about what what this does to Trump's potential run in 2024, because it has not gone anywhere near as well as he and his closest uh, conspirators or confidants both wanted and believed it would go. But then again, he's not a normal candidate at the best of times. He's not a normal candidate, and we presume that he is still going to go ahead with next Tuesday's announcement at Mar-a-Lago, which will undoubtedly be that he's planning another run for the presidency, and he's uh, announcing his campaign to win the keys back to the Oval Office in 2024. I mean, the answer to the question of what all of this has done to Donald Trump can probably be found in the sunshine state of Florida, where Governor Ron DeSantis, first of all, the entire state turned Republican. The Democrats had a catastrophic night there last night. And Governor Ron DeSantis overwhelmingly won re-election and immediately in his victory speech hinted uh, at greater things to come. Now, there's no doubt that he is eyeing the possibility of challenging Donald Trump for the Republican Party's presidential nomination. There are other Republicans out there that may do the same, uh, including Governor Glenn Glenn Youngkin Mm. uh, of Virginia. He wasn't on the ballot last night. He wasn't up for uh, a re-election. The race wasn't taking place there. Uh, You know, former Vice President Mike Pence might fancy it. Mike Pompeo, the former Secretary of State. So this is is going to be a competitive primary 
And uh, Donald Trump is going to have not only to explain uh, why he didn't deliver the red wave. And I think it's fair to say he didn't deliver it. He is the man who has projected himself over the last several weeks and months as the leader of the opposition in a country that doesn't have one. There's no leader of the opposition here. The title doesn't exist. The, 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 The job is non-existent. So he made this campaign his, and he's going to have to explain why the Republicans in some of these races came up short. And the other problem he is unquestionably going to face is the hot breath of the Department of Justice Mm. that he can already feel on his neck. I mean, one of the big questions now is, what does the Attorney General of the United States do? Will he take criminal, uh, launch a criminal indictment against the former president uh, for the role that he played fomenting those riots up on Capitol Hill on January the 6th? The Department of Justice indicated they would not bring charges against Donald Trump or any members of his inner circle within a 60-day window of the midterm elections. Well, that window has now closed. So all eyes once again on the DOJ. Watch this space. Final question, Simon Marks. Um, Where does Ron DeSantis stand on the big lie? Uh, He's been very careful, uh, as has Glenn Youngkin in uh, Virginia, um, to do nothing to infuriate Trump supporters, okay. uh, but uh, to, on other issues, pander to them. So um, he's been very careful in terms of keeping distance between himself and the big lie, insisting, for example, that election integrity is very important and there's nothing wrong uh, with re-examining the country's laws on elections, but not embracing the notion that Joe Biden is an illegitimate president. Mm. Indeed, you'll remember the two men met and stood uh, side by side one another uh, after the recent hurricane uh, in Florida just a few weeks ago. However, in all of the uh, kind of cultural and political tropes that he embraces, he absolutely uh, panders constantly and creates straw men constantly uh, that uh, that he knows are going to appeal to Trump voters. And at the end of the day, that's the key, right? If you want to be the successful Republican candidate in the presidential nomination who isn't Donald Trump, you've got to find a way of steering clear of some of the conspiracy theories, but articulating messages that ring the right bells and check the right boxes for the extremists within the Republican Party that Donald Trump mainstreamed during his presidency. Simon Marks, absolutely brilliant, as always. Many thanks indeed. Um, I don't know if you're across this yourself, Simon, but I feel that we should probably spare a moment to congratulate the state treasurer of Alabama who's just been re-elected, a gentleman who rejoices in the name Young Boozer. It's 12.52. Did you enjoy that little sneak preview of my prediction of how Donald Trump will deal with the embarrassment of the midterm results? Well, now you can have it in full full effect. You've endorsed more than 330 candidates this yeah. election cycle. Uh, tonight, win or lose, the results for Republicans, um, how much of that will be because of Donald Trump? Well, I think if they win, I should get all the credit. And if they lose, I should not be blamed at all, OK? But it'll probably be just the opposite. Uh, When they win, I think they're going to do very well. I'll probably be given very little credit, even though in many cases I told people to run. And they ran, and they turned out to be very good candidates. You know, they've turned out to be very good candidates. uh, But usually what would happen is uh, when they do well, I won't be given any credit. And if they do badly, they will blame everything on me. So I'm prepared for anything, but we'll defend ourselves. (laughs) <laughs> He's such a man-child, even by his standards. If they win, I should get all the credit. If they lose, I shouldn't get any of the blame. I, listen, if you're still sucking on the teat of his misinformation, I don't know what more you would ever need. I thought that years ago. But um, my goodness, he laughs at you, doesn't he? He makes you such a laughing stock, in, in, even presumably now in your own head. If I win, if they win, I should get all the credit. But if they lose, I shouldn't get any of the plan. He means it. It it literally means it. There it is. Plain sight. 12.53 is the time. Much more serious matters now. Rachel Venables uh, returns with... uh, Back to the Grenfell Tower inquiry. Well, actually, you, you take it from the top, Rachel. Well, this is a really significant week in the inquiry, James, because after four years and more than 300 days now of evidence, we are witnessing the final closing statements of the very last part of the Grenfell inquiry before the chair, Sir Martin Morbick, retires to consider that 
huge, hefty weight of evidence and to write his final report, his final series of recommendations. That's not expected to be published until we think later next year. Uh, But this week it was the chance of the lawyers representing the core participants to stand up and for 20, 30 minutes at a time to, to really lay their final blows and to put their final points forward to him. Uh, On Monday, it was the turn of the lawyers, those representing uh, big groups of bereaved and survivors. They demanded the inquiry result in criminal prosecutions of the many organisations and companies involved. They referred to a rogues gallery of firms responsible as they see it for the 72 Mm. lives lost. And under particular attack on Monday, again and again were the companies that made the combustible cladding and the insulation that was fixed to the tower. Here's Mr Adrian Williamson, who's at King's Council. The inquiry will need to condemn the actions of the manufacturers, Arconic, Celotex and Kingspan in the strongest possible terms. They were at the very least reckless in pushing dangerous products into the market. In selling those products, they were fraudulent in their sales tactics and in their dealings with those who were charged with testing and certifying the products. Now, through this process, these companies have denied serious wrongdoing and also argued their actions were in lines with regulations at the time. And Mr Williamson also argued that Sir Martin Morbick should go after the governmental bodies, the regulators who were responsible for maintaining and looking after building safety. So how could these rogue companies operate so successfully and so shamelessly? Well, um, the story there is that the testing and certifying bodies, the BRE, the BBA and the LABC, were at best asleep at the wheel in engaging with these manufacturers and at worst positively collusive with them in their sales tactics. On any view, they were far too close to their, quotes, clients, close quotes, and far too reluctant to bite the hand that fed them. While towards the end of the day, another solicitor, Imran Khan KC, he demanded the companies involved apologise when it came to their final statements, unreservedly, he said, to Grenfell's victims. It seems to our clients that what is now required from each of them is an unequivocal, unambiguous and forthright apology for their part in the disaster. And in the event that any does not, our clients will consider this to be injustice heaped upon injustice. Well, I can tell you that did not happen. Instead, the following day, we heard from the lawyers for Kingspan, who made a small amount of the insulation on Grenfell and Arconic, who made the cladding. They blamed each other. You can hear from both of them now. Not only was the presence of the PE, ACM and cladding the principal cause of the fire spread over the tower, as has already been found, but it was the overwhelming cause of the rapid fire spread. Placing blame on others, and especially on the company which we represent, is a very convenient way of avoiding their own responsibility. So that was first Kingspan's lawyer, Geraint Webb KC, followed by Stephen Hackman KC for Arconic. He claiming that people pointing the finger at his company was uh, the company he represents was convenient. Yeah. He also claimed that their cladding was entirely lawful and said it was the fault of the architects and the contractors not reading the small print, failing to check if it was suitable for the building uh, that actually was to blame for the dreadful fire. He also, in an attempt at defence, pointed out that more heat was released by the burning contents of victims' flats than the combustible cladding. It's worth emphasising the Module 7 evidence as to the contribution to the fire of the apartment contents which in the end were probably more significant in quantitative terms, in terms of um, uh, heat loading, than any other factor. Lawyers representing other core participants will be heard uh, throughout the rest of this week, some today and finally tomorrow. They include uh, representatives from the Council, the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, the Housing Secretary and also the Mayor of London. Any scientific basis for that claim that the contents of the flats contributed more than the cladding? Well, I think right. that that was ev- from evidence from a previous module, which right. did suggest that overall, you know, and he was talking there about the com- the compartmentalisation yeah. failing. But of course, the oh, question okay. is, why were those flats going up in the first place? How was that being spread? And yes. uh, the awesome. chairman found that was the cladding. Thank you, Rachel. Tough, uh, as always, but, but, but masterful. Um, I'm going to end on a much lighter note, actually. I think we could probably do with a smile. Uh, this will be on your telly tonight. Do you remember Matt Hancock? Yeah. Whatever happened to him? 
another tunnel. Yeah. Are you going in? Yeah. Right. Feel around everywhere. They Feel could everywhere. be anywhere. Oh. 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 That's a load of slurry. Just pulled on my head. Wait, are you still carrying on? Yeah. Wait for me. OK, come down the tunnel. Head, are you ready? Is that your shoe? That's your yeah, foot? Yeah, that's my foot, yeah. Oh, God. Oh. Keep going, but I can't find any stars. Oh, one minute gone. <laughs> so here there's a left turn or straight on. Which way do you want me to go? Which way do I want you to well, go? Well, I don't mind. I'm not a sat nav, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> Which way do I want you to go? <laughs> well, hang on, what? Um, I'm, going, I'm going left. Right, OK. Can you feel my foot? Uh, yes, 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 yes. Right, we've got... Oh, something's being thrown at me! I think someone was put over there. Keep searching around. You OK? What? <laughs> Not to be missed. Um, that's it for me for another day. T time, time now. Oh, I beg your pardon. Of course, if you missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, where you'll also find all of LBC's shows to catch up on, as well as the world's biggest podcast and John Sweeney's new one. So download Global Player for free from your and app James's. store. <laughs> yes, and Sheila's. <laughs> or, or head to Global. Poor old Rachel hasn't and got Rachel. a podcast. <laughs> Coming up at four o'clock on LBC, it is Tom Swarbrick. Globalplayer.com is, of course, the app that you need. Time now for Sheila Podcast Fogarty. Ah! I'd never go on that programme. Never. You, you literally have to pay me. Well, you do, that, that is part I, I know, of the arrangement. I know, I'm joking, I'm joking. I literally, you, you, there is no amount of money that would make me go onto that programme. Nope. 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 Nope.